Hey, I'm Chris Ralph, the professional prospector, and I'm coming at you today from the gold fields of California, the Sierra Nevada. Uh, you look behind me and you'll see that there's kind of low rolling hills and not really high mountains that uh, I'm used to. But we're going to talk today about greenstone belts. Now, there is a greenstone belt. This is a greenstone belt area. But greenstone belts are important gold producers all across the planet. Lots of gold that comes from Australia is from greenstone belts. Lots of gold that comes from West Africa is from greenstone belts, but also from California and Nevada and uh, Arizona and other places as well. Now, not every gold deposit in the world is a greenstone belt, that's for sure. And one of the most important things to know about greenstone belts is not every green colored rock is a greenstone. And uh, not every line of, of green colored rocks is a greenstone belt. Greenstones are a kind of metamorphic volcanic rock, a rock where a, a volcanic rock has been compressed by heat and pressure, and they're often found in, in zones of, uh, of tectonic pressure, and, and faults are created in there, and there's heat, and hot water comes up, and a lot of times the hot water is gold-bearing, and it creates veins, quartz veins, and in those quartz veins can be gold. And that's part of why greenstone belts are important producers of gold all across planet Earth. Again, like I say, not every uh, producer of gold is a greenstone belt, that's for sure. And not every green colored rock is a greenstone belt. But let me start by showing you some pictures of greenstone rock from gold bearing belts all across the planet and I'll say a few words let me show you take a look here are four different greenstone rocks basically these are all rocks that were associated with gold deposits and in fact I've found gold quite close to all four specimens that I picked up here the two on the right are from the United States the upper right is from California the lower right is Arizona the Two on the left, the upper left is from West Africa, and the lower left is from Western Australia. Now, note, these rocks are the same kind. It's four different kinds of rocks that are very similar, and yet they're all associated with gold. Like I say, not all greenstone deposits have gold, and not all gold deposits um, are in greenstones or associated with greenstones. But greenstones is a very common, greenstone belts are a very common form of gold deposit and are found basically worldwide in, in many areas and have been produ important producers of gold. And this will give you an introduction of what greenstone rock actually looks like. And you can see that, uh, you know, gold is found in greenstone belts. It's very common, both nuggets and uh, quartz veins for underground mining, that sort of thing. Both can be important hosted, important deposits of gold you know, hosted by greenstone belts. Now a belt, what I mean by that, is a, a long zone, usually they're long and narrow, so it would be so many miles wide, but a lot more miles long. So it's shaped kind of like a belt, and, uh, and, and it's these kinds of rocks, and in various places in these belts are gold deposits. And there are important areas that are being explored for gold deposits too, not just producers, but areas that the mining companies and, and prospectors and, and individual miners uh, go looking for gold. Like I say, both in the United States, but also Australia, West Africa, and other places across the globe. Now let me tell you a little bit more about greenstone belt deposits. Greenstone gold deposits belong to the group known as orogenic gold deposits, and the term orogenic means that the processes are involved in the formation are related to the same forces that cause mountain building. Orogenic gold deposits actually are the main source of gold for humanity. 
These deposits form from the oldest geologic ages to comparatively recent times, but at crustal depths of more than 4 kilometers, or about 3 miles. It's believed that orogenic gold deposits formed vertically along large crustal faults at elevated pressures and temperatures. This illustration shows the general process. Hot, gold-bearing waters move up the openings in the faults and eventually, through one mechanism or another, release their gold to form veins. The quartz and carbonate minerals that make up the waste part of the vein are released at roughly the same time, and so it forms the veins that we see on the surface. As I noted, greenstone gold deposits are a subset of orogenic type deposits. Greenstone hosted deposits are the most important of the orogenic class and are well represented by large deposits that contain more than 10 million ounces of gold. Still, these deposits can range from very tiny to the gigantic. This illustration shows the relationship of different types of orogenic gold deposits. In all of them, the function of faults as conduits for gold-bearing fluids is important. The quartz carbonate veins in these deposits, these greenstone deposits, typically combine with both laminated veins, and laminated means a, a bunch of uh, parallel veins uh, close together, um, combined with moderately to steeply dipping shear type fault zones and arrays of shallow dipping extensional veins in the adjacent rocks. The vein deposits are typically distributed along specific regional fault structures which are commonly found where differing types of rocks meet together and are often related to tectonic plates colliding. The most important gold districts are also often associated at the boundaries between contrasting rock types within the belts. These are different rock types that are brought together often by faults and the fault is located where the two different rock types come together. Along these structures, the deposits themselves commonly cluster at bends or major splays where the, the fault splits off and, and splays out into separate uh, branches. And where these deposits occur, um, where they have these, these bends or splays, um, the deposits actually occur in secondary or higher order fault structures related to these other features. These deposits are also associated with slate belt and banded iron formation gold deposits, which are the two other major orogenic class of the gold deposits. Now I hope you found that to be educational and interesting, and uh, maybe it'll help you in your own personal prospecting of going out and finding gold. I've been doing some metal detecting here, and I'm wandering around through the, these uh, rolling hills. You know, it's, uh, it's February, and the We've had a little rain and the hills are nice and grassy. It's, it's almost park-like and beautiful out here. In fact, it's, it's kind of even a little warm. It's in the mid-70s. And, and I've been finding some nice little nuggets. Uh, let me show you pictures of the nuggets that I found. So here's the pieces of gold I got. All the nuggets um, came out real nice. The total weight on these, they all have good character. The total weight is 7.2. Four grams which is just a little shy of a quarter of a troy ounce pretty good I was real happy with the take the uh, biggest nugget on the left there was actually a partial Sun Baker when I found it a uh, part of it was actually exposed to the sunlight and I went to pick it up and it was bigger than what was exposed and so I was real pleased it's a very nice little nugget and this was a, a great way to start off the year because this is uh, my first detecting trip of 2022. Now I was camping out there and I had a little misadventure with my tent. I, when I got there I put the tent up and we had a quick lunch and I decided we would go do some metal detecting see if we could find something that afternoon and I figured oh, I'll finish setting up my tent uh, uh, when I get back for dinner time. So we left the tent there and we actually stopped and visited with the property owner on the way back in and by the time we got there it was dark and I, we drove up and it's like, what happened to my tent? And it turns out that while we were gone, they actually run some cows on this property, not a huge number, but there are some. And 
the cows came and smashed my tent. They knocked it over. They uh, bent some of the tent poles that hold the tent up. And then the gray colored tarp, you can see some dark colored liquid on the tarp. Yep, that's cow urine. And so they uh, not only knocked it over, but uh, relieved themselves on it. And that was how I started the trip. But it turned out pretty good, and I had some pretty good luck. And I do want to talk to you more about the detecting aspect of things. Now, I promised in my video where I said that I was going to do uh, more taking you guys out in the field. And, you know, I'm doing some metal detecting, and I still got a little bit more time left. And what I want to do is to try and uh, have a chest mounted camera. I've got a little GoPro knockoff. It's not really a GoPro, it's a Chinese knockoff of a GoPro. And uh, I'm going to attach it to uh, a chest harness type thing and, and then show you me metal detecting. And I'm going to talk about metal detecting when I'm out there. I've seen people do. Uh, cameras mounted on the actual shaft of the metal detector and and what happens is the camera's going well as the person swings the metal detector and I, I don't think that's a very positive experience because it's almost like it makes you dizzy but I think the chest mounted thing you'll just you'll just be moving along with me as as I walk and I think that uh, I may focus more on actually digging targets out of the ground and you can hear what the target sounds like and I can talk to you about what I think it is and uh, hopefully that'll be educational. But uh, again, I hope you like this Greenstone Belt uh, presentation because I'm here in a California Greenstone Belt getting some nice gold. And they're good places to look. Okay, I'm, I'm on my way to a different place but these are workings that the old timers worked for gold. Anyway, one of the things about about metal detecting is a lot of times if you're walking from one place to another, turn on your metal detector. Especially if you're going through some area that's been worked by the old timers. You know, you just might happen onto a an unexpected nugget. And this area was worked. And so I'm I'm swinging my detector just to uh, to see if I can't can't get onto a, an unexpected nugget. Now, as I'm I'm going up this slope and detecting, I'm running the detector and I'm scanning it and searching for targets that indicate non-ferrous. You know, so far I'm not really finding any. Now, now that's a loud target, but it's going all to the ferro side to the left which is indicating that it's probably you know a rusty old square nail or some other piece of iron junk that I really don't want to dig and the problem is there's so many hot rocks here and so much iron trash that I really need to focus on on those targets that indicate that they're not that they're not iron junk so I'm scanning around and looking for targets that are a little more likely to be gold I, that I just I thought I'd show you this, and when I find one that's that's the right type, I'll I'll show you, and we'll pinpoint it, 
and dig it. But until then, I think I'm going to shut the thing off and continue to scan, looking for good targets. Okay, I've found one that indicates non-ferrous, and I just thought I'd show you. If you look at the indicator, it's going mostly to the non-ferrous side, to the, to the right. All right, so I'm going to dig this, and we're going to see what we got. I'm going to turn the camera off, though, because I have to bend over and dig, and the camera will be pointing all different directions. And so let me uh, dig this and see what we got. Okay, this is what the target was. It's not gold. It's a piece of chewed-up aluminum. Um, in metal detecting, when chewed-up aluminum gets uh, chewed up by a lawnmower and sprinkled in a park, uh, it's called can slaw. But because this is an area where there's a lot of cows, we call this chewed up and, and pooped out aluminum. We call it cow slaw. So this is not gold, nothing exciting. It's a piece of cow slaw. But, you know, by cutting down to just the ferrous targets or the non-ferrous targets, we're greatly reducing the amount of digging that we're having to do. Okay, I've been swinging my detector for about... Mm, 10 minutes since we last spoke and I'm again over a target that shows non-ferrous. You can see that the bar indicator is showing non-ferrous. Now this could be a piece of lead, it could be another piece of cow slaw, it could be a gold nugget. And so the only way for us to find out for sure is to dig it up. And so first thing I do is kind of pinpoint. And you can see that if you don't get right over, you can get weird. But when you're over the strongest signal, then you get uh, get the, the accurate discrimination reading. And so from what I can see, the target should be about, about right there where I made that little divot right there. And if you go over that with your detector with the discrimination setting um, on the, the gold monster, then you'll see that, you know, it indicates non-ferrous. So again, I'm going to turn you off for a second and dig this target and then I'll show you what we got. So I don't know if you can see this, but that target turned out to be a bit of buckshot. It's a little bit of lead buckshot. And that's how gold prospecting is, folks. You know, you go along and sometimes you get gold and sometimes you don't, but you got to have the persistence to stay at it because if you dig two targets in their trash, and you give up, you're not going to find any gold. But if you stick with it, you will. So I found a piece of cow slaw and this bit of buckshot from many years ago. And I will now resume my prospecting and see if I can find some nuggets. Okay, it's been a bit and we got another non-ferrous target. There we go. This one's hitting non-ferrous, non-ferrous, non-ferrous. So it's pretty reliably non-ferrous. So let me uh, dig this one out and I'll show you what it is. Uh, you know, it, it's just like this. I was just thinking, eh, what if I don't find a nugget to put on the camera? You know, it, it, it sometimes works that way. Now, uh, this is the first time I've done this with this uh, chest mounted unit. And I want you guys to comment for me whether you think it's a waste of time or it's not very good or whatever. Because uh, what I want to do is in the past, I've had a fixed camera on a tripod for any detecting that I do. 
but when you're wandering around, the fixed camera on a tripod isn't very convenient. So what I want to try and do is intersperse the chest mounted and the, the shots taken with a camera on a tripod and kind of mix it up and that'll kind of give you the best coverage. At least I think that I'll be able to do that. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, like I say, in this particular outing, because the camera on the, the chest is brand new that I'm just going to do that. I'm not going to try and have a tripod as well. But in the future, I think that that would be a good way to really demonstrate for you guys what uh, what prospecting is like. Okay, well, I was lucky. That one was actually a, a little nugget. You can see just in front of my finger the little flat nugget of gold. And so I did get a nugget today and filmed it on camera. That uh, That is helpful. So... I'm going to finish with this. We're almost done for the end of the day uh, today, but I'll uh, put the camera on my chest again tomorrow and we'll do some more of this just so you guys can see how it looks. Like I say, this one, the, the uh, metal detector was real sure that this was not a piece of rusty iron junk and sure enough, the detector was right. It was a nugget. So I didn't actually put the uh, chest mounted camera on my chest for the next day. I figured what I caught, uh, what you've seen just now, is enough to give you an idea of what uh, it would work out to be like. And I think that by using the tripod and the chest mount together, I think we can get a lot of good video and some good nuggets captured on film and that it would be a, an experience that reflects what the prospecting is really like. So. That's pretty much it for the nugget detecting segment of this video. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. And one of the things that I like to say is that uh, if you're interested in improving your skills as a prospector, learning what it takes to find gold, because honestly, finding gold is about what you know. Yeah, having good equipment is, is good. And, you know, having the right equipment is helpful. But a metal detector isn't going to put you in a place where there's gold. A gold pan isn't going to put you in a place where you can dig gold. A sluice box, a dry washer. You have to take them, you have to take the equipment, and as the prospector, you have to find the gold. Those pieces of equipment just help you recover it. So I wrote a book about prospecting called Fistful of Gold that'll help you learn more about prospecting if you're wanting to do that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now. So let me tell you a little bit more about my book. Um, it's called Fistful of Gold and I wrote it because I want you to be able to go out and find for yourself Fistful of Gold. And uh, you can see that it's a, an encyclopedia with all kinds of information, pictures and that sort of thing. It's not in color but uh, uh, color would have cost me a lot more to have printed and so the book would have cost a lot more. It's for sale on Amazon and you can pick it up. I'll put a link in the description below. I also serve as the editor for a, a prospecting magazine. It's ICMJ's Prospecting and Mining Journal. And honestly, you should check that out. We've got stories uh, and information, legal stuff, everything you know to increase your skills as a prospector. I write articles in this every month and a lot of other very experienced prospectors contribute to the magazine as well. So check the magazine out. Also, I have a website and the website is uh, at nevadaoutbackgems.com. I'll put a link for it in the description below, but there's gobs of information there that you will find useful in your prospecting efforts. Finally, I want to say that I really appreciate your comments and thoughts and even a positive criticism. Don't come on there and just toss out insults because I'll just delete your comments. But if you've got uh, helpful things to say and questions to ask, do write and, and put those in the comments because I answer my comments to people and uh, you'll hear from me in, in you know, in, in responding to you. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this video and you like what you see and you're interested in uh, finding out more, well then sign up, subscribe, and hit the, uh, the notification bell so they'll let you know when I post new videos. 
and you know like it and share it if again you you see stuff that you really are excited about and i'll be coming out with lots more new videos and so we'll see you again real soon